It will regulate a militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is great to have you with us on the program this afternoon uh, or today or this evening, maybe tomorrow morning. I don't know when you're watching this. Uh, Jim Wallace of the Gun Owners Action League. You might even be listening to this. You might even be looking at my smiling face. Uh, Jim Wallace of the Gun Owners Action League going to be joining us on the program here in just a couple of minutes talking about a really bizarre piece of legislation that has been introduced in Massachusetts. It's already scheduled for a hearing next week. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, in, in my years of covering uh, anti-gun bills, I've seen a lot of them. I don't recall anything that looks exactly like this screening for gun ownership and uh, then uh, providing counseling for those patients who've tested positive for gun ownership. I know it is bizarre. I'm telling you, we'll get to that in just a moment. I do want to give you a a quick update on the Second Amendment Sanctuary Movement in Virginia. It was a a quieter day yesterday, uh, Wednesday, uh, just a, a few counties holding meetings. We do have two more a new Second Amendment Sanctuary counties. We had another uh, Fluvanna County decided that uh, they're going to hold a special meeting on this issue uh, next week, uh, moving it to a bigger location so the more folks can attend. I was actually in Fluvanna County yesterday. I got there about 15 minutes after the meeting began. And uh, the uh, county seat in Fluvanna County is a little town called Palmyra, Virginia. Uh, it's a really old town. There's not a lot there. There is almost no parking. And there were... Uh, cars uh, close to a quarter mile away from the courthouse and people walking. And uh, so they want to open this up and allow more folks to attend. So they're going to do that next week. And then Suffolk County uh, did not take any action despite a huge crowd. Uh, I think VCDL, Virginia Citizens Defense League, estimated the crowd at over 500 people. Uh, but they did not take uh, any action on the Second Amendment Sanctuary uh, 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 resolution. So if you live in Suffolk County, uh, Virginia, you need to make sure that your supervisor, your county supervisor, has heard from you on this issue because apparently uh, they may still be a little reluctant to uh, adopt a Second Amendment Sanctuary resolution. So we'll have much more on that. Uh, also, uh, we're going to have much more on BearingArms.com today about Michael Bloomberg, uh, who is going to be in Aurora, Colorado, to announce his official campaign gun control platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, why Colorado? Well, it was the site of the Aurora shooting back in uh, 2012 that led to gun control laws being changed in Colorado in 2013. Uh, Michael Bloomberg strongly supported those laws, and he uh, ended up spending some money uh, both in support of those laws and in defense of lawmakers who faced a recall effort after uh, after they cast the deciding votes in support of these additional gun control laws. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, I expect, will talk a lot about that, how he took on the NRA and won in Colorado. But I don't think Michael Bloomberg is going to mention the fact that violent crime has gone up by more than 25 percent in Colorado since those gun control laws that he fought so hard to put in place actually went onto the books. Violent crime has not dropped in the state. It has gone up considerably with universal background checks, with a magazine ban. Uh, And with, uh, I'm guessing, the addition of this red flag law that's going to be implemented in uh, Colorado come January, I don't think that's going to do anything to reduce violent crime in the state either. But uh, we will have much more coverage on what Bloomberg had to say coming up uh, at uh, BearingArms.com today. Right now, let's listen to what Jim Wallace from the Gun Owners Action League in Massachusetts has to say about this crazy new bill that screens patients for gun ownership. Jim, thank you so much, sir, for coming to the program. It is good to see you again. Hey, Kim. Welcome back to the battleground state, the Second Amendment battleground state, right? Yeah. What is what is this here? I, I saw this alert from the Gun Owners Action League about uh, uh, a screening for gun ownership in Massachusetts. Yeah, th- this is uh, pretty bizarre. It's, it's a very small bill. It's only one paragraph long. Uh, it's uh, called House 2005. And the title is an act uh, to prevent gun violence. But when you read the bill, the language in this thing, Cam, is it's scary. I mean, it's almost the 1984 stuff, right? I mean, it, it's just Orwellian because what it says is that all patients shall be screened for gun ownership. Well, I mean, what's that mean? I mean, screened for what? And, and it actually uses terminology like 
screened positive for gun ownership. I mean, is gun ownership now a disease? Is it a communicable disease? Um, and then it also talks about if the patient does screen positive for gun ownership, that they should uh, be provided with counseling. So, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff over the years, Cam, but this one just really goes to the heart of the way gun owners are being treated, not only in mass now, but to some extent across the country. It's kind of scary. It it, it, it really is bizarre. I mean, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, the, the text of this bill, and, you know, again, I mean, what it's talking about, as you say, there's not a lot of details, right? Uh, very, very vague and, and very fuzzy. Um, it mentions something about Section 236 uh, of the Massachusetts law. Um, and it says Section 237, director, the director shall establish a program for firearm screening and counseling. Such programs shall systematically screen all patients for the presence of firearms in their home. Uh, and then, as you say, the director shall, after consultation with recognized professional medical groups and other such sources as the director deems appropriate, which opens the door for, I guess, you know, gun control groups maybe to be a part of this process, promulgate regulations establishing, one, the means by which and the intervals at which patients shall be screened for the presence of firearms in the home, and two, guidelines for safety counseling for individuals that screen positive for the presence of firearms in the home. Um, so first of all, I, I, again, I mean, I, I have some uh, really big questions about, uh, uh, you know, what, what this all means. I'm looking at Section 236 of the Massachusetts General Laws, and that talks about non-discrimination in organ transplants. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I honestly, Jim, I have no idea, as you say, what this is supposed to entail, how many people could get wrapped up into this. And by the way, what does that mean to screen for the presence of firearms in the home? Does that mean that somebody goes into your home to look to see if you have any firearms? Well, that's a good question because, I mean, there are so many questions here. For instance, it, it talks about the director. In researching the particular laws they're, they're talking about, all of which fall under the Department of Public Health, what director? Because there's, as far as I know, there's several directors on the Department of Public Health. So it doesn't even tell you what director they're talking about. Usually you can go to the definition section of a chapter and it will tell you what a director means, what a commissioner means, who it is. And in this case, there's no such definition. So we don't even know who's going to be setting this up, number one. Number two, it's, it's using terminology as if gun owners and gun ownership is, in fact, a disease. Now, remember, I mean, you've how many stories have you covered where the other side has tried to make, uh, you know, gun injuries a, a public health crisis? Now they're treating it as a public health crisis disease. So by the terminology they're using, I mean, you're screening somebody for measles, you're screening somebody, I don't know, for whooping cough or something. Now you're screening people as as being positive for gun the presence of guns. It's just bizarre. Yeah, and the treatment is counseling, right? So, right. so uh, you know, which which tells you again the the idea is that owning a gun uh, is bad, uh, and you need counseling for that. H have you reached out to the uh, legislator who who authored this bill to ask him what the heck this is all about? Not yet. the uh, The hearing is next week, so I'm going. There's be, already a hearing on this. Yeah, there's a hearing next week. Um, I think it's on Tuesday, so I, I'll be going certainly on Tuesday to, to see if I can learn a little bit more and to obviously talk with the committee on this because uh, this is pretty scary stuff. Now, anybody can file a bill, you know, and a, a lot of people will say, "Well, you shouldn't be able to file a bill like this." Well, unfortunately, in Massachusetts and a lot of other places, you can file pretty much any bill you want. There's sure. no filter for which bills go through to be filed. Um, but but again, this, this you know, there's a lot of people that say your tinfoil hat, if, if you look at something like this, man, this is a lead hat. I don't think this is a tinfoil that's going to do it here. So, I, I mean, it's just, it really is very strange. And, and I'll do my best to, uh, to reach out to this lawmaker, but it's called uh, House 2005, an act to prevent gun violence, right? So yeah. uh, uh, clearly here, this is not 
designed to, I mean, at least from, from, from what I can tell, this isn't, you know, dealing with individuals who are, let's say, already under the care of the state of Massachusetts. I don't know why on earth they would need to be screened for, for gun ownership either. Uh, but I, and this is just, you're, you're right. I mean, I, you know, and I, I see a lot of really bad bills introduced each and every year. Uh, the short title for this uh, relative to screening certain patients for the presence of firearms in the home. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's all that it says. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. Will you come back on the program next week after this hearing so we can talk yeah. more about what you've learned about this bill? Absolutely. Because the, the other thing that, you know, we were discussing this as a staff yesterday and we were trying to figure out, okay, does this mean like somebody who's under some psychiatric treatment, should they be screened? Is it people who we think are suicidal? But the way it's written, it means any doctor and any patient. You know, if they're coming to see you for the flu, you're supposed to screen them for gun ownership. So that's the way it's written. And, you know, for an entire medical community to start screening all of their patients for gun ownership uh, and then counsel them on it, what qualifies them to counsel me on on firearm ownership? So um, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens at the hearing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're absolutely right, Jim. And and you know, again, I I'm always cautious when I see really weird bills. Not to get too far ahead here, but it just is, you know, we've been talking. So, Section 111 of the or Chapter 111 of the General Laws that's public health. Yep. And then it just says it's hereby amended by inserting after Section 236 the following section. So there's a whole new section here. Right. And this is not dealing with organ transplants. This is not dealing with, you know, organ transplant recipients or medical technologists. No. The director shall establish a program for firearm screening and counseling. Such programs shall systematically screen all patients for the presence of firearms in the home. Yeah, it doesn't specify uh, what kind of patients. It says all patients. Yeah. So that and, any doctor of any kind in Massachusetts is supposed to screen their patients for guns. And if you have a gun, then you're you're supposed to a I guess inform your doctor and b, uh, you know, then you'll be provided counseling for that. Right. I mean, first of all, Jim, I think it's an awful idea to treat, uh, uh, you know, gang violence, domestic violence as a as a public health epidemic. Um, Bloomberg's out there doing it. He's he's releasing his gun control proposal today. He's going to be talking a lot about uh, the the public health epidemic of uh, of gun violence, but. It seems to me like even if you're an anti-gun advocate, even if you don't believe that you should own a gun or I should own a gun, telling doctors you have to screen every one of your patients to determine if they have guns in their home. And then if they do, you're supposed to, uh, you know, work with uh, the the Department of Public Health to ensure that there are, uh, you know, uh, counseling uh, methods available. And then... You have to uh, decide what intervals at which the patients shall be screened for the presence of firearms in the home uh, going forward. I mean, you want to you want to talk about getting gun owners to not talk to their doctors. This is a great way to get gun owners to absolutely maybe not even go and visit a doctor anymore. Maybe that's maybe that's the goal, Jim. Maybe they want us all to die from heart <laughs> disease and cancer because we we don't want to go to the doctors because the doctors are going to wag their fingers and refer us to counseling if we're gun owners. Right? Can you imagine if doctors? Uh, we're told they should screen their patients for who they voted for. Imagine, <laughs> imagine how that would go over, you know, and then provide counseling if they thought you voted for the wrong person. So it's it's it, it's just another piece of the pie that they just keep throwing on top of our shoulders. And the, the fact that they're trying to con- continue to try to treat this as a public health crisis. Listen, you can't treat you know, accidental gun deaths like you treat homicide gun deaths like you treat suicide gun deaths. Everything has to be treated differently because there are different methods for treating those particular issues. But how is a doctor, and I've spoken to a lot of doctors on these issues, not this particular bill, but these issues, and it's like, do you know enough about guns to talk to me about guns? And what happens if you run up against a doctor that's anti-Second Amendment and doesn't think anybody should own a gun? So now you've got to bring politics into medicine. And, and for some reason, the medical community just can't see that. You know, and it's interesting, too, because there was, a, um, there was a, a, a study that came out, I think it was last week, and I'm trying to find it. It was from a researcher in Boston at Boston University, and I cannot recall her name, 
Uh, but she took a look at at uh, juvenile uh, gun deaths, and she found that they went up, even in states that passed gun control laws, uh, that they continued to go up over the past few years. And so her whole point was, look, these gun control laws aren't the answer, uh, which I thought was shocking to come from a, a researcher in, in Boston, Massachusetts. She said, you know, these broad based gun control policies don't actually address the problem. You've got to deal with the individuals who are committing these crimes. You've got to deal with the environments in which they live. Uh, but simply passing another gun law or four or five uh, is not going to reduce these deaths, uh, as, as her statistics have shown. Uh, and yet, you know, again, as you say, that is that is very much not the majority opinion, uh, certainly among gun control groups, gun control advocates. But even within the medical community, there is this idea that by making uh, gun ownership a, a, a public health issue, that we can somehow reduce uh, these types of crimes. Well, I mean, it, it's it's sad, too, because. They absolutely refuse to acknowledge their own numbers. Remember back in January, Cam, when we put out that report using the state's own numbers that showed that gun-related homicides doubled after they passed the gun laws. And according to the FBI, Massachusetts is the most violent state in Northeast America. You know, the other day I went to try to look at to see if they had any new updated reports on what we had published using the state's own numbers. And we mm -hmm. found out that the state had pulled off the web all of the reports that we used to build that report. They're all gone now. All right. Again, I, I'm not entirely sure what this bill is dealing with. We're going to try to find out. But, I, 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 again, just based on the language, based on the section of the general laws where this proposal would go, I don't think it is an unfair assumption. I'm not saying it's the right. I'm not saying it's accurate, but I don't think it is an unfair assumption to say that this could apply to perhaps every patient going to visit their doctor in the state of Massachusetts because there's no limiting language. As I said, this is truly a bizarre bill. And, and, and as Jim Wallace mentioned, this doesn't mean it's going anywhere, but the fact that it's getting a hearing uh, frankly, is is troubling enough. So we will continue to pay very close attention to uh, to this bill in uh, the state of Massachusetts. Right now, let's get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivism report. Man, this one is... A husband and father of three kids is dead after he was taken hostage during a home invasion. And as it turns out, the suspect in this case, who's now facing murder charges uh, and life behind bars should not have been out on the streets to begin with. Should absolutely not have been out on the streets to begin with. Michigan, uh, WWMT uh, reporting on the uh, a case of uh, William Jones. He's 35 years old, faces a charge of open murder, one charge of home invasion leading to murder, and three attempted murder charges of three law enforcement officers. Five of the charges he's facing carry the possibility of life sentences, according to WWMT. Uh, according to the prosecutor, it was December 1st of this year, just a few days ago, that uh, deputies were called out to a home in Comstock, Michigan, uh, after Jones made the victim in this case, Christopher Neal, uh, call 911 after he broke into the home through an unlocked back door. Deputies say that this guy was uh, armed with two handguns. He sent Neil's wife and kids upstairs. He took Neil into a bedroom, locked the bedroom door. Uh, as uh, SWAT arrived outside, they began trying to negotiate uh, uh, with Jones. At uh, some point, a shot was fired. Police entered the home and found Neil dead. Uh, as they were trying to uh, enter the home and enter that room, Jones was firing out the uh, locked bedroom door at officers. Uh, three law enforcement officers were actually hit. Uh, and then uh, Jones, as officers stormed the bedroom, uh, tried to jump out through a glass window. According to WWMT in Michigan, Jones has a lengthy criminal history, including a series of burglaries in Calhoun County. In February of 2018, so this is less than two years ago, Jones pleaded guilty, or excuse me, pleaded no contest to one felony count of assaulting a Battle Creek police officer. 
He has pleaded guilty to at least four domestic violence and assault and battery charges between 2017 and 2018. In April of this year, he pleaded guilty to a felony charge of an illegal sale and use of a financial transaction device, which is a nonviolent crime, but which is at least his second felony in the past two years. In addition to all of the other charges, now there may have been more felonies. I don't know if the domestic violence charges were misdemeanors or if the assault and battery charges were misdemeanors or, or felony assault and battery. But again, multiple opportunities, not just to arrest this individual, charge this individual, but but multiple opportunities to put this individual behind bars after guilty pleas to felony charges. And instead, Jones was on the street, broke into someone's home, robbed a family, not of their belongings, but but of their husband and of their father. When he should not have been out on the street to begin with. All right, on to our uh, armed citizen story of the day. Chicago, Illinois. CWB Chicago reporting that a uh, citizen held a robbery offender at gunpoint, uh, but the uh, armed citizen may be in some trouble of their own, thanks to Chicago's gun control laws. Uh, They say officers responded to the LaSalle Blue Line station uh, about 6.50 in the morning after 911 callers reported that a man beat and robbed a passenger while riding a train. Some callers reported that the robbery offender was lying on the platform with a private citizen holding him at gunpoint. When cops arrived, they were able to take the suspect into custody. A 29-year-old man told police that the offender lunged at him As he sat there on the uh, commuter train, the offender began punching him in the head and face, uh, then took uh, some property from the man before he uh, exited the train. As uh, CWB Chicago reports, a private citizen intercepted the officer on the platform, or the offender rather, on the platform, held him at gunpoint until police arrived. Uh, That individual does possess a valid firearms owner ID card. And uh, according to a source... Uh, As of midday Wednesday, prosecutors in the Cook County State's Attorney Office continue to mull the possibility of filing weapons charges against the citizen. Among other possibilities, the Good Samaritan could face charges for possessing a firearm on Chicago Transit Authority property. That's that's the rub there. So it doesn't matter if you possess a valid firearm or ID card. It doesn't matter if you possess a valid concealed carry license. The Chicago Transit Authority is one of those no-go areas for legal gun owners. And so this armed citizen who actually helped police bring a robber to justice, or at least start the process of bringing a robber to justice, uh, could be facing charges of their own. Now, I don't know that there's been a specific lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the gun ban on Chicago Transit Authority property, but I I would be very interested to learn what the uh, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals might say about this. Uh, The prevailing uh, a case law in the Seventh Circuit, which encompasses Chicago, Illinois, is that you have a right to carry outside of your home. Uh, that's why the state of Illinois has a shall issue conceal carry law in place, because their ban on carrying firearms was challenged. Ultimately, the Seventh Circuit said, yeah, this ban is unconstitutional. You do have a right to carry. And uh, rather than appeal that case up to the Supreme Court, gun control advocates convinced lawmakers in Illinois to Uh, no pun intended, bite the bullet uh, and adopt a very restrictive shall issue policy, but a shall issue policy. Uh, Given the fact that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals has said, hey, you know what? You do have a right to carry outside of your home your your right of self-defense. I think Judge Posner's uh, comment in uh, in this particular opinion was that um, your your need for self-defense may be more acute on the streets of Chicago than on the 37th floor of your uh, apartment building. And so your right to keep and bear arms absolutely extends outside of the home. I would argue uh, that your right to self-defense may very well be needed while you are riding the subway in Chicago. More importantly, I would argue that your right of self-defense, your right to carry outside of the home is curtailed by not being able to lawfully carry on Chicago Transit Authority property. Because if you can't carry on a bus or you can't carry on a subway car, your lawfully possessed, otherwise legally carried firearm, then that means that you also cannot lawfully possess and legally carry your firearm during those blocks that you are walking from the subway station to wherever it is that you're going, whether it's work or home or uh, you know out to dinner with friends. 
So you are deprived of the right of self-defense from the time you leave your home until the time you get back if you use public transportation in any way, shape, or form. Now that the Seventh Circuit has already said, hey, you know what, your right to self-defense and your right to be armed for self-defense does not go away when you leave your home. Does it make sense that it should go away when you set foot on a public property? Again, I, I don't know that this case is uh, going to lead to a court challenge, but I, that was my first thought when I uh, uh, saw the uh, possible charges that this armed citizen is facing. All right, finally, our uh, good deed of the day, WRAL in Raleigh, North Carolina, with the story of a Kansas mom who is searching for a uh, good Samaritan who uh, helped cheer her daughter up uh, during a pretty difficult time uh, there in Charlotte. Um, they, Kayla Foster is her name. That's the mom's name. She says that uh, she and her family were visiting relatives in the Charlotte area uh, for Thanksgiving uh, when her husband fell and hurt his back. So uh, Kayla and her seven-year-old daughter, Molly, were waiting in the emergency room, uh, and Molly just broke down, according to her mom. She said she got concerned that she wasn't going to be able to see Santa and give him her list. She was very upset and crying and just being the dramatic girl we all love. Trying to calm her down didn't work. She wasn't buying anything I said. And that's when this stranger walked up, started talking to Molly, said, um, have you made a list for Santa yet? And Molly shook her head no. And the woman pulled out a pad of paper and, and pencil and said, well, will you write down your list for Santa? And so Molly did. And obviously, as Molly's doing this, the tears dry up and the <laughs> stops and the normal breathing returns. And... Um, and so Molly finishes writing. She gives the list to the woman. The woman walks away. Comes back a couple minutes later. And uh, she's got the piece of paper. And she gives it to Molly. And uh, Molly unfolds it. And she sees that Santa Claus has signed this piece of paper and has uh, included a uh, with the paper this silver ring that uh, was not there before. Very mysterious. And then the woman told Molly that Santa's watching all over the world, according to uh, Kayla Foster, quote, that no matter where she is, Santa sees her, that Santa tells her all the time what a sweet little girl Molly is. Kayla says Molly's face lit up so bright, she said she was headed to see Santa soon, and she would make sure that Santa knows that Molly is on the good list. And then uh, Molly hugged the stranger, uh, and the stranger walked away. Kayla Foster uh, is back at home in Kansas with her family now. She says that uh, Molly has not put the ring down since her encounter, and uh, she is hoping um, that she can find this woman. She says uh, she thinks the woman may work at Concord Mills Mall in Charlotte because she told Molly to come visit Santa there if she is ever back in town. But, uh, yeah, she's looking for whoever this stranger was that presented this uh, little hand-signed Santa Claus note to her daughter Molly. So in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to uh, comfort a little girl, whoever this mysterious stranger is in Charlotte, North Carolina, we thank you for your very, very good deed. All right. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Thank you again for being a part of the program today. Don't forget, tomorrow, all emails, all the time. If you got a question, you got a comment, you can uh, send it to me at cam.edwards at bearingarms.com. We're going to get to as many of your thoughts and uh, your questions and your comments as we can on tomorrow's program. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the show as a podcast at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, townhall.com's podcast page. You can also become a VIP member of Bearing Arms and get exclusive commentary and analysis, as well as editor's chats. Thank you again for being a part of the program today. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. We'll see you back here tomorrow with another Bearing Arms, Cam and Company.